Well, I'm Jacob, and um, I live like five minutes away from here, and I've been coming here like my whole life. And well, I like to talk about the the river that's um, right here. Um, I found out a lot recently that um, the river used to like back in the day before it was polluted. The Bronx River, the Bronx River, it's the Bronx River. So um, in Riverside Park, which is a waterfront access park. Um, the, the river there used to like have a lot of fish and like clams and other sea creatures because it's connected to like the big body of water that's there and like I thought that was interesting because I never knew that I thought it was just always a, a dirty river that no one goes in it's just that's it that's all it's ever been but I found out that it actually had like sea creatures and life and I found out it used to be much larger than what it was until landfill came and it actually um, narrowed the river and deepened it. I, I don't know, that was like hundreds of years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I found that out. Um, also that, um, something else. Oh, that because um, of the pollution, there used to be no like fishes living there, but now they're coming back and we found like um, actual clams living there, like barnacles, you know how they go. So that's actually good for us. So we're like, actually cleaning up the river. Cool. I thought that was really good. And not a lot of people know about that. They mm -hmm. just think it's the river and that's it. Cool. Definitely, we have two parks here that's a waterfront access and the river is still dirty. That you can't, you can't really swim in it. And I would, like, I, would, I would like for everybody to enjoy the river. I know people fish sometimes, but sometimes you gotta really clean it. Right. Of the pollution. I remember one time something that really like that caught my attention around the area. I don't remember where. I think it was around. Yeah, it was around a park. And, Which park? Uh, Crotona Park. And there was this there was this man, and he was being very generous. Like he had like a a, a cardboard, and he was like, "I'll give you one dollar if you share your story." And it was really beautiful to me because he was like. He want, it's like, you know, you don't often see that, especially around this area, you don't often see that, like, giving someone a chance to express themselves, especially through something that's really lovely, though, and, like, you know, instead of asking people for money, you know, he's actually sitting there, he's like, you know what, I'll give you a dollar if you tell me your story. No, but I watched him the whole time, like, there's, you know, sometimes people have a tough time talking about things, and... You know, it's it's always good to have someone to listen out to you, whether it's somebody. You know, sometimes holding in things can be really hard to express. And even though it's hard to sometimes, sometimes you just gotta find a way out. And I guess that's what's wrong with, you know, our the area, people, the country, the world. You know, like, we hold so much things inside that we just don't know how to release it sometimes hmm. and it's to see something like that around the area was just you know really shocking but you know it was really beautiful at the same time to see someone you know helping out you know a random stranger you know it's you know it's a form of caring i guess that's what we need around like lately nowadays around the area it's just like full with like you know ignorance and you know lack of knowledge and you know it's just a lot of people get involved with you know, gangs and, you know, I guess people, some people feel safer in a gang when it only causes just more problems. Hmm. Um, you know, it's just, you know, lately it's just been more violence around and there's lack of knowledge and people don't know what's really going on in the world, hmm. what's really going on in this neighborhood, what's really going on in our country. And people don't see that their ignorance, ignorance is a social disease. Ignorance is a social disease nowadays, especially around here. And it's just like, you know, sometimes we need to find a way to like let people know what's really going on, what's blinding guts, what's blinding people. Without people's help to like, you know, stand up for our rights, it's just we're going, we'll be going down a wrong path. Uh, my name is Ruth Torado. Okay. So I go to a high leadership charter school in the Bronx. Um, I've been in action, this is just about my second year in action. And I always loved how we're, we're able to go and change our community, find out the problems, find out how we can change it, and really just try to go and tackle these problems. 
But what I did not realize was sometimes how dangerous it can get because there was there was one time we went protesting um, at Interville Green, I think, and it was about the Sheridan. And we wanted to either get rid of the Sheridan or like make it something different out about it because only about 20% of the residents here even use it. And that's not even to say that they use it every day. We don't know how, how much they use it. It's a problem because it splits our community and we could use, that space could be used for parks, we can use it for schools, we can use it for anything else, but there's a, instead we have a huge hot highway where only trucks go through, which only increases pollution and not even our own residents use it. So we were at this, we were at the protest and we were um, trying to figure out what the solution would be. And we were with the Department of City Planning. They were going to explain to us um, how the Sheridan moves throughout the whole, how, how it moves throughout the Bronx and like specifically which parts they would be addressing. And they just decided, okay, today we won't be able to talk about the Bruckner, and the Bruckner area. And we were just like, wait a minute, we're in the Bruckner area. This is the reason why we came to this meeting. Why won't you talk about it? And the whole reason we were there was because we were expecting to hear about our area and how we were going to get rid of the Sheridan, and they would not talk about it. They, refu they refused to. They didn't have. Apparently, they didn't have the information. And I got a little bit scared because people started getting angry, and I was just. It was very tense, and I wasn't sure what to do because it was just. I, I'm used to protesting. I wasn't used to people getting angry at protests. So it's just like if if someone starts throwing things, I don't know what I'm. I don't know if I should just leave or. Right. Because I know that as an activist, I should fight for what I believe in as far as I can go. And I want to stay there, but it was just like, I don't know what, like how far to go. And one of the things we were told to do was that if, if things really get intolerable, then we start chanting. Um, I forgot to chant, but we had to start chanting and then we would just get up and we would just leave the meeting. And that's exactly what we did. Wow. So it was that moment for me was just like I had to think about I had to rethink how far I would go for my community because I didn't realize how dangerous it could get. Despite the fact nothing actually happened, it just got very angry and we yelled and left. But it was just like it was just the thought that okay, what if something does happen? How far would I go to keep fighting? Hmm. Well, <laughs> interesting. Um, I think it's very important to keep fighting because if you're if people only fight up to a certain point, then other people will see, oh, all right, this is where you're going to draw the line and stop fighting. We're going to keep going up to that line so you'll stop and then nothing will ever get changed. So I think it's always important to keep fighting no matter what. Hmm. So my name is Chandela Cruz. <laughs> cool. So when I was younger, when I was about 14, 15, yeah, 14, um, summer of 2000. One. No, 2000. Summer of 2000. I started in this group called Action, um, and we were first. We were eight members, and it didn't even have the the title. the The name of the group wasn't even Action yet. It was just kind of like us coming together. What we did know is that we were learning about the Bronx history, which was like never taught to me. This was the first time I was like actually learning about my history. And I'm from the Bronx. I'm from Hunts Point, um, 163rd and Hall Avenue, and. Um, it was the first time that I was like learning about my history when I, and that was pretty cool. My, um, unfortunately I moved to Florida when I was 15, but then I came up at 16 years old for the summer of like 2003. I came back and I got my job back at Action and all of a sudden it was called Action. It was like more, a little more structured. Um, we had about like 20 young people and it was like really cool. Um, and again, learning about environmental and social justice, so just like learning more about the Bronx. One day, my boss, Janice, uh, took us to this place that she said would, would turn into a park one day. And she's like, there goes the Bronx River, and this is going to be a park. And what I saw was definitely not a park. It was just rubble and a hot mess. Right? I was just like, oh, Lord. And this woman was so adamant about this is going to be a park, and it's going to be great. And I was just like, maybe. Like, in my head, I was just like, okay. Right? Like, because at that time there were no parks in Hunts Point. I grew up where there were no parks. We, we'd usually just play like in concrete, like playgrounds, you know, but like playgrounds with like no grass, like nothing. So I grew up without parks. Um, so when she said parks and green space, like it was like too good to be true kind of thing. I was just like, it's okay. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to fool me. Like I'm fine. Um, and when I came back in 2009 um, to the point, 
one of the first events that I had to go to was something called um, the South Bronx, celebrating the South Bronx Greenway, um, and it was at Riverside Park. And when I go into Riverside Park, I was like, why does this seem like deja vu? I was like, something's like off here. Like, I don't, I don't know. I've never been to this park, but something's off. And it's actually the park, the, the rubble space that I thought was a piece of crap was actually Riverside Park. Um, and I went in there and I was like, she, she wasn't lying. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is crazy. And it was really amazing to see it. Um, Cause not only because I felt something, you know, it was more about just like being there and feeling like I've been here before. But I was like, no, I know I haven't been here before. Um, and then I realized that it was that part. I'm Alexandra Ramos. I live by Simpson, but it's connected to Hunts Point, so I basically say Hunts Point and Simpson. So, mm -hmm. um, well, from the history. I've heard about Hunts Point is that Italians worked there. Not they worked there, they lived around there. It was mainly more like white people, like not even white people. It was just at that time a lawyer could live next to someone with a lower income. I think this was during like the 1950s, mm -hmm. something like that. Cause I did a for I did community service and we had to know the background on Hunts Point. And it was like, we read about this guy named Morris something, that he's the one that put the, the shortcuts in the highways. And because of those shortcuts, they, they were like, people would get like a week's notice. Not even, I think they would just break down their buildings. And then like, if you were there, like, it was slow for, it was, um, damn, I can't, hold on. It's like, yeah, that guy. Robert Moses, he made the highways and then like he kicked out like a lot of people like but then like the lawyers, the doctors, they just moved out because they had money. But then like the lower income people like they became homeless, they needed to be in shelters or something like they didn't have money, stuff like that. So well now they're doing the point of why and all that is because we're doing this thing now where when we was taking surveys, it was on how we can make our community better because it's like, who else knows our neighborhood better than us? So they asked people from our neighborhood, what would you prefer? Like, um, uh, do you agree that the food, the healthy foods are expensive? Do you think we should have restaurants um, on Hunts Point? Because they closed down all those stores by the Bruckner Bridge and we were talking about how that bridge divides Hunts Point from the other side. Mm -hmm. It's like a different vibe when you go from across the bridge. So it's like we're trying to change that vibe and like to um, take out that vibe like because they closed down all those stores and then they had people from the community paint them mm -hmm. different colors and then we even got feedback like oh it seems like a brighter p place to be at like because most people, like, once you go on the other side of the street on Hunts Point, it's like, at night, people felt like they were going to get robbed. Or, like, the prostitutes were, like, threatening them or, like, harassed. Like, it was little stuff. So, yeah. This is 163rd Hunts Point. They're making this, this green thingy. What's that? It's like a trail, like... A greenway? Yeah, a greenway. Like, they're trying to plant more more trees and stuff to mm -hmm. the environment by Hunts Point because like since there's so many buildings and the factories are like giving us so much carbon dioxide the um grass and stuff is going to give us like an equal amount of oxygen for us to inhale because it's good because like because of the buildings going down factories that's affected like our health mm -hmm. that's affected like the breathing asthma mm -hmm. And we need to make the community better and safer.